I want to uh, welcome everyone here uh, to our uh, Furnace Book Award talk. Uh, I'm Christopher Jelpe. I'm the director of the Mershon Center for those of you who may not know me. Uh, and we are uh, very, very pleased to uh, welcome today our guest, uh, Dr. Dmitry uh, Chernobrov, who uh, is the, the winner of the Furnace Book Award. Um, for his, uh, for his book on public perception of international crises, uh, which is um, definitely a, a passionate interest of mine. Although I have to say, I, I was not on the committee that s selected the, the work. So it wasn't just the fact that I'm interested in this that, uh, that got the award. You, you impressed a very wide uh, range of, of scholars with your outstanding work. Um, I do wanna thank the, uh, the Furnace Book Award Committee for uh, for their work um, on uh, on selecting uh, Dimitri as our winner, we uh, we do get a large number of submissions, and so I know it's a lot of reading for that group. And I thank you all very much, uh, even if you do get to read uh, wonderful books uh, uh, like Dimitri's. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Chernobrov is a senior lecturer in media and international politics um, at the uh, University of Sheffield. And uh, I, without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Dimitri to, um, uh, to talk with us about your project. And I'll ask in terms of our questions, uh, if people can use the raise hand function after uh, the presentation is done, and then I'll call on people and manage the, the Q&A session that way. So um, thanks very much. And, um, Dr. Chernobrov, uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for such a warm welcome. And I'm absolutely delighted to be selected as the winner of the Book Award. And thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and um, just to situate this a little bit more into what I do. So my research is mostly about public perception of international crisis. But I, and, and that's what I am going to talk about today. Um, I also do some of the other work on diasporas and conflict. So, for example, particularly on how diasporas fight online information wars when their homeland is at war. And that is definitely something that we see a lot today with the current situation in Ukraine as well. Although my work is, more, is based more on the previous conflict in 2020, the Karabakh war between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I've got an article in International Affairs coming out in a few days. And the third strand of my research is on public diplomacy and the communication of contested international events, events where states insist on the opposite interpretations of um, a particular event and the way they could use um, humor strategically uh, or other narrative tools and formats um, in order to reach out to publics to shape public perception and to um, promote um, their vision of, of the event. So this is a little bit more about um, what I do. But today I will be talking about uh, my book, Public Perception of International Crisis. And the book is principally about three things. Um, so one of the questions I'm asking is, um, how do we make sense of distant international crisis? And the second question I'm asking is, why are some representations more appealing than others? So these two questions have largely been explored in political communications literature. So for example, um, the questions on, of, of media effect and how um, media can have a persuasive power over public opinion and the way, for example, societies come to understand threats. What, is the, um, what are the global threats today, depending on how salient those threats are in media coverage. There's also vast literature on persuasion, on public diplomacy, in the way how states may be able to promote particular representations and get them accepted by the wider publics. But more, but more generally, I think limiting ourselves to just these two questions is a little bit problematic because this uh, treats the issue of representation and perception largely within the field of accuracy. So are the representations and perceptions accurately reflecting the true nature of the events or the true nature of a particular group, a society, an, an identity group, or are they inaccurate? And here the question of accuracy and inaccuracy has for a long time shaped policy and um, our social responses. So for example, at the political level, very often errors or political mistakes, miscalculations are often interpreted in the sense that information was flawed. If only we had better information, if only we were better informed, 
the policy would be better. At the societal level, for example, things like prejudice or stereotype are often treated as inaccurate representation or portrayal of the other side. So again, the question of accuracy, true reflection of things, or um, ability to really know, these become central in the traditional literature about uh, perception and representation. Um, at the policy level, also in, in times of conflicts, for example, the whole doctrine of the hearts and minds, again, is about communicating to the other side a favorable um, image and a favorable message, and how do we convince the other side that um, you know, our narrative about the conflict or about the crisis is, is, is the correct one. So largely the focus on the existing, in the existing literature on explaining these two questions, how, how do we make sense of distant international events and why are some representations more appealing than others has largely been limited to the analysis of accuracy. And so what distinguishes my approach is that I add a third question and I ask what do the re these representations and perceptions mean for how societies understand and imagine themselves. So I argue in, in my book that perception is largely not about the event. It's not about the object that we are describing, but largely it's about the subject, what I call the drawing self. Um, so the um, motivations and fears and hopes and memories that we ourselves have that shape our understanding of, dif of distant events. Another thing that interested me as I was approaching this project was the idea that representations and perceptions of complex, very complex, sometimes unexpected international events seemingly, be, seemingly become final. Like we arrive at the conclusion what these events really are. And that representation comes with a feeling of certain finality to it. So for example, in, um, in 2011, 2012, when we had a number of uprisings in, in the Middle East and North Africa, these were very quickly labeled the Arab Spring. And that was the accepted label. And that was the essence of these events. So that, that was it. And that label stayed for, um, for, about, uh, for more than a decade. Or um, no, global terrorism or a new Cold War. These labels emerge out of many multiple competing representations of international events. And for some reason, they become accepted very quickly or they, they, they give the sense of finality to our representations. So what I argue in the book is that we need to look beyond the event itself and to seek the reasons for the acceptance of certain narratives, again, within the subject that is doing the representation and doing the perception rather than um, the event itself. So um, a short clarification. Um, so the book is about public perception of international crisis. So what do I mean by international crisis? So generally, crises are situations of instability, uncertainty, disruption of routine, and disempowerment, where we feel unable to fully control our own circumstances. And so this definition is, is quite broad. So I'm not just talking about wars and conflicts between states, but also crises as um, situations where we would be experiencing major challenges to the way we understand the world or we understand our own place in the world, be it national self-representations or um, any other identities that we take. The international aspect of, it, of, of crisis is important in two areas. So one, it involves different states, communities or groups and their physical or symbolic boundaries. And again, I would emphasize that I'm not just talking about national identities or national um, policies and foreign policy, but communities and groups um, which could be um, envisioned in, within other symbolic boundaries. And also international in the meaning of distant, crises that we do not witness ourselves, crises on which, to understand which we rely on media representations, political representations, other forms of representation, and which we largely imagine rather than directly experience as the general public. So to give, to give you an overview of the book, I'm going to tell you four, four stories. So the first story takes me to Moscow to 2012, when I was conducting interviews for this book for, with, uh, with the um, general public in Moscow about their perception of the events in Libya and Syria. And this case, the case of the Arab uprisings is 
key to the book. So that is the, may, the main case that I was looking at. I compared the Russian and British public perception of the events that were happening at that time in Libya and in Syria, and which became later known as the, the Arab Spring. So I was interviewing a student in Moscow, and we, we had been talking for about half an hour when the student suddenly leaned, leaned towards me and said, look, the Arab Spring was done by the Americans. They wanted to create a League of Allies to destabilize us. They already started doing it with gay rights in Europe. They finance these movements and spoil our demography in the long run, like fewer babies every year. Europe does not understand it yet. What they worry about is that Gaddafi sponsored the electoral campaigns of Sarkozy and Berlusconi also borrowed a lot of money from him. So they did not want to pay back their debts and had Gaddafi killed. So that was the story told to me, the perception of the events by, um, by, by that person in Moscow. And the interviewee, on the one hand, was telling me information that he considered important. Like, um, and, and, and that purpose can easily be assumed um, behind um, sharing views on, on politics or ideology or stereotypes. The listener often focuses on the object of the story, on the claim that is being made. Is it true? Is it not true? Is um, Europe to blame? Is, is the US to blame for the Libyan uprisings or not? Was it in fact Gaddafi, or was it in fact Berlusconi and Sarkozy taking revenge on Gaddafi or not, etc. So our focus is very often drawn to whether the claim made in the representation is true. But I suggest that we also need to look at the speaking subject, at um, what I call the drawing self. So the, the person who was telling me this story um, gave away quite a lot about his own conceptions of his own identity in, 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 in telling me this. So, for example, this included a clear association with the National Collective. So he said that the Americans are about to destabilize us, meaning a very close association with, with the Russian national identity. The desire for it to be strong and stable, a certain hint at the other's impurity, Europeans taking dirty money and, and, and behaving in, in, in uh, an ungrateful way towards Gaddafi, or an assumption of superior knowledge to the European other, like we know that you know, uh, the um, financing of, of uh, for example, LGBTI groups in Europe would spoil the Russian demography, etc. So sharing these views was not just about the truth or the falsehood of these claims. It was also about um, telling and expressing the feelings that these representations allowed the speaking subject to enjoy. So that is, that is the first argument that I'm making that we need to look when analyzing perceptions and representations, we need to look at the drawing self. Um, so not just at the, at the level of accuracy, whether the claim is right or wrong, accurate or not accurate. We need to look at the feelings that certain representations allow the self to enjoy. The second story um, is also from an interview in, in Moscow. I was interviewing another person, a young woman um, aged around 25, and um, we were talking about Gaddafi. And she said, I don't know much about Gaddafi, but I really like him. And I said, okay, tell me, tell me more. Why, why, why do you like him? And she said, what I really like about Gaddafi is that he always stayed a colonel. He never promoted himself to general or marshal or never invented the highest military rank for himself like Brezhnev did in Soviet times. So, and here there was a very clear comparison to um, Leonid Brezhnev, the, um, the Soviet leader for, for quite a while, who awarded himself piles of medals, became four times hero of the Soviet Union, um, invented as, uh, you know, the highest military rank for himself, etc. So, for that person, for, for the person I was speaking with, distant events in Libya were not about Libya. They were about the Soviet memories and reworking of the memories of the Soviet leaders and their um, absolutely shameless cult of personality, etc. So in the absence of knowledge about Gaddafi, so the, the Libyan uprising was largely the unknown. Publics tend to fill the unknown with familiar memories, ideals, and traumas, however disconnected they may be from the actual event. And so 
here we can be talking about how perceptions are self-informed. So in describing the Libyan uprising, um, that person was not actually talking about the Libyan uprising, but was informing it with familiar memories from um, their own past and their own national identity. The third story is a different one. It takes me to Britain in 2013, 2014, the New Year's Eve of 2013 and 2014. So if we remember that time, that is before the Brexit referendum, that is the year before the Scottish independence referendum. So, um, and, and, and the debate about migration, about the, um, uh, the, the Scottish independence, et cetera, they are, they are quite active at the time. So what happened on the New Year's Eve of 2013-14 is that Britain changed um, the rules that applied, the migration rules that applied to Bulgaria and Romania. Um, restrictions uh, were lifted, so uh, workers from those countries could come to Britain and work without a visa, without um, seeking any um, additional bureaucratic permits or formal, uh, formal applications to work. And so there was a wide discussion about how would that influence um, the British culture, how would that influence migration, um, and, um, and there were, uh, again, wide debates about this in, in the media. One of the major British newspapers, the Daily Mail, on the New, New Year's Eve came, came out with the, um, sub, uh, with, with the heading, sold out, flights and buses full as Romanians and Bulgarians head for the UK. One airline has even doubled the number of flights. This news piece was shared online over 58,000 times within the first week of, since publication. It attracted almost 2,000 readers' comments online. And the highest rated comment, so the most popular one, was shame on our government, shame on our once great nation to be invaded like this. We must take action. At the same time, the, the more liberal press in the UK promoted a completely different picture. So, for example, um, another major newspaper, the, uh, the Metro, came out with a headline, Romanians and Bulgarians completely fail to flood the UK. That was also popular, shared thousands of times. And um, one, one, of the, one of the tweets that was widely um, publicized in the media was this one, heard a rumbling outside and thought it was the stampede of Romanians and Bulgarians. Turns out it was someone moving a bin, false alarm. So what is striking is not that the society here was divided over the issue of migration, whether this was cultural invasion and migration should be fought, or whether this is, um, you know, this is something to laugh at and the, the, the fears of the, of the more conservative or far right are completely unsubstantiated. What is really striking is that this is happening New Year's Eve, so within hours of the policy change. However, both sides are already very certain about the outcome of that policy. So in other words, Romanians and Bulgarians either already flooded the UK or already failed to do so. So in other words, we're talking about perception, how perception creates certainty and empowerment. So while the actual, the real, the objective um, effects of the policy are still uncertain, the society largely escaped into illusions of knowing, however imprecise they may be. And these were shaped by the previous political outlook, the political views, previous um, debates on migration, etc. But in other words, escaping uncertainty enabled agency and enabled empowerment. So that is the third main argument I'm building, is that in our perceptions of unexpected, uncertain crisis, we're seeking certainty and empowerment, however imprecise uh, the imagining and the perception that result. And finally, the fourth story takes me to 1896 and uh, to Italy. In 1896, um, Italy was in a crisis. The Italian army was um, sent to conquer Ethiopia, but very unexpectedly suffered a major defeat. So this was a major military disaster in European colonial history. This led to huge debates within, the, within Italy, within Europe, to the downfall of um, Francesco Crispi's government. And the reason was that Italy was largely expected to win. The 
racial and and um, Western uh, imaginaries of of the time contrasted the progressive modern technologically advanced racially superior um, Italian army and suggested that they were fighting a horde of savages. This was supposed to be a small war, a very quick war, and suddenly it led to defeat. But what is really interesting is what happens next. So instead of questioning self-perceptions, instead of questioning whether the Italian army is progressive and modern, whether the Italian society is superior, instead of challenging these colonial representations of the self, what happens is that the Italian media, the Italian society largely challenges the image of the other. And what is happening is really, um, you know, unprecedented. So in, here I'll read out a quote from, um, from a historian of Ethiopia. And um, he suggests that since racism did not permit, permit Westerners to acknowledge that black men could defeat whites, Europeans suddenly discovered that Ethiopians were Caucasians, white people darkened by exposure to the equatorial sun. While previously Ethiopians shared sloth, ignorance and degradation of um, other African nations, they suddenly became portrayed as energetic, enlightened and progressive. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church, previously reviled by white clerics as debased and corrupt, was now seen as a proper vehicle of the Holy Spirit. And the Ethiopian army, previously portrayed as a cowardly rebel, was suddenly pictured as a magnificent force of heroic marksmen. So what happens is representations and perceptions of the Ethiopian uh, army and the Ethiopian other become completely reinvented. This uh, means reinventing racial stereotypes, reinventing ideas about religion, about class, race, um, and, um, and, uh, and progress. And all of that becomes reimagined so that losing to an equal opponent or a superior opponent is more acceptable than, than losing to somebody very inferior. So in order to escape the trauma of an unexpected defeat, the Italian society escapes into imprecise imagining that still defends a positive and idealized version of the self. So that is the fourth main argument that I'm making, is that in our perception, we are, if, uh, we are um, protecting self-affirming positive and idealized representations of ourselves at all costs, even if it means that we're completely reimagining the other. And again, the question of accuracy is not the central question here. This representation, this perception is not about the other, is not driven by the other, but it's driven by how we as a society want to protect our positive and idealized versions of ourselves. So to sum up the four stories, I'm arguing that in analyzing perception, we need to look at the drawing self, the inner motivations and needs of a subject that lead it to perceive events and their agents in a certain light. I also argue that this perception is largely self-informed because we fill the unknown with familiar memories, ideals and traumas, and they could be completely disconnected from the actual event. So self-conceptions are always going to be present in our perceptions of the other. These self-informed perceptions largely give us certainty and empowerment because otherwise the, the alternative is inability to act, inability to know where the boundary is. And so we need to escape into illusions of knowing, however imprecise they may be. And so self-conceptions, um, in this sense, knowing who we are, while not knowing what the opponent is like or what the events are like. So self-conceptions become a very firm set of coordinates, and um, they become an appealing source of certainty. And finally, because perceptions become linked to our own memories and our self-narratives, there's also a degree of self-affirmation in the way that publics perceive international crisis. So imprecise imagining defends a positive and idealized version of the self. To ground this a little bit more in, in theory, um, I am using two major theoretical approaches in the book. One is ontological security and the other theories of self-affirmation. So with ontological security, I'm sure that quite a few people here in the room would be familiar with this, so I'll only cover the basics. But I'm arguing that public imagining of crisis is driven by the societal need for ontological security. And here, ontological security is meant as, on the one hand, biographical continuity, 
So the consistent self-concepts, the consistent biographies that we tell about our identities, about our collective groups, how we establish our sense of being, our sense of belonging and our, our, our place in the world. Apart from continuity of narratives, so the narrative side of this, um, it also transforms into routinized relationships where, um, for example, states pursue routines in foreign policy as more familiar and more secure um, avenues of action or societies escape into routinized relationships with others, routinized portrayals of others. So here there's a difference between ontological security as the security of identity about the security of, of, of being um, and the physical security, which could be expressed, for example, in the um, you know, security of alliances and, and balance of power and military might, material aspects of security. So in here, again, there's a vast literature um, on state foreign policies and how states, for example, could be pursuing both ontological and physical security at the same time, or one would mean, um, uh, would pose a threat to the other. At the society level, there's again a vast literature about how, for example, pop populism, um, stereotypes, prejudice, how they establish a sense of ontological security and, and continuity by identifying clear um, enemy constructions and um, projecting blame for internal problems on, on external uh, targets. A central notion in ontological security is the notion of anxiety. And here, um, in, anxiety is central to our understanding of both uncertainty um, and international crisis. So anxiety is, is typically inherent to identity constructions. So here we could be talking about the finitude of being and how um, our understanding of our existence, the existential anxiety of being, how that um, is connected to um, trying to establish routinized behaviors and avoiding questioning um, our own self. There could also be an argument about limited material foundations or temporal, how identities, any identity we can pick, national identity or any other um, form of uh, collective identity, how is that has very limited material foundations and could be temporal. And so establishing this as continuous is one of the um, aims of um, seeking ontological security. There's also um, an approach that treats communities as imagined, for example, and, and insists of, on the constant renegotiation of identity boundaries, and not least through language, so such as the Lacanian uh, approaches suggest that even language and discourse itself are the sites of power, renegotiation, and change. The concepts, the ideas, the descriptions that we tell about ourselves, they depend on unstable, non-material things such as language, symbol, and discourse. So ontological security involves the forgetting of this anxiety about um, the finitude of our being um, and um, behind, behind the illusion of continuity and routine. And one of, the, one of the differences here, and again, one of the curious differences that ontological security studies emphasize is the distinction between anxiety and fear, because very often the two are um, interchangeably used in wider international relations scholarship. So fear, for example, quite counterintuitively can be a welcome condition where, for example, um, it can enable self-protective behaviors. So for instance, it's, it, instead of just anxiety, which doesn't have a particular object or response, if, for example, somebody is afraid of flying, they can take self-protective behaviors. So for example, not take airplanes. Fear can create predictability. It can give purpose to destroy the enemy, to overcome uh, the fear, etc. So in other words, the more feared constructions, the more feared perceptions, labels, ideas about the other that is more frightening can surprisingly be more welcome than the uh, more general anxiety and uncertainty of a crisis. So to, to, give, to give us an example, in, in recent years, there was widespread, um, widespread descriptions of the current tensions between Russia and the West as, as a new Cold War. But again, the representation of the new Cold War seems to be an escalation. So it, seemed, it, it is supposed to be more frightening in material terms because it could be leading to more to escalation, to confrontation, et cetera. But from the ontological security perspective, it can actually be more controllable, more familiar, because by applying the label of a new Cold War, um, actors and agents 
understand what needs to be done in order to win it. Um, so, and that descends into familiar policy routines of sanctions, for example, or military exercises, um, deterrence, alliances, etc. So, if we think about uncertainty in in terms of time and place anxiety here, anxiety is largely about the unknowable present and future, what is going to happen to the subject. And an anxious subject expects the worst to happen. However, knowledge, and here I'm, what I mean by knowledge is the, the combination of representations that we have, memories and, um, and perceptions of events. Knowledge is what has been encountered. So a subject can be, see, can be seeking security in knowledge as expecting the normal and the known to continue. So and in this sense, if we rethink knowledge, not as, and again, here I emphasize why I'm, you know, I'm moving away from this idea of inaccuracy or accuracy in analyzing perception. If we rethink knowledge, not as a set of accurate or inaccurate beliefs about international others or about international events, but if we rethink knowledge as a routine, something that stays with us over time, that comforts us, a place where we can escape for familiar representations. So that would mean that the core of the problem, the core of you know, how we analyze perception would shift as well. So we, wouldn't, we would no longer be looking at the inaccuracy of knowledge that causes conflict, but rather about what kind of feelings, um, what kind of consequences does the feeling of knowing enable us to experience um, during international crisis. And here I'm suggesting two concepts um, in order to analyze public perception. One is the anxiety of the unknown, the moment of uncertainty when subjects experience the urge to allocate the unknown to familiar, even if inaccurate or feared frames. So we need this in order to become agents, in order to, um, to act. And as the result, um, the publics very often escape into what I call misrecognition, the illusion of knowing or recognizing an unexpected event as something that is familiar and in gaining familiar contours, it becomes less troublesome. So to emphasize, misrecognition is not about inaccuracy or distortion, but it's more about the sense of security, continuity, ability to act, and reduction of uncertainty. So misrecognition pr provides the seeming sense of finality and precision at any given moment that we know exactly what is going on. Even if this is inaccurate, even if this is um, a distortion, what really matters is that feeling of security that misrecognition can, can give us. Another major theoretical part of the book is about self-affirmation. So what I argue is that identities are largely formed around self-boosting traits or positive self-conceptions. So it's not just that we tell stable stories about ourselves, that we tell continuous stories about ourselves but that publics both at individual level and collective level tell, uh, tend to tell a positive story about themselves with very few exceptions. If we think about um, you know, the management of, of, of memory at, at the state level or the, the state holidays that we commemorate or histori historical education at, in school, we focus on achievements, on victories, on, on chosen glories rather than traumas. And even if we do focus on traumas, very often there's an emphasis on how much the society has changed to overcome those traumas or to, um, to correct the injustice. In times of uncertainty and, and um, crisis, I argue that societies affirm positive self-conceptions. So it's not just about the continuity as an, as an unchanging narrative, but a continuously positive self that societies seek to defend in perceiving international others. And here I am drawing on the work of, of Bourdieu, who um, put forward the idea of distinction. Um, so according to Bourdieu um, and his theory of um, social and economic positioning, what really gains value in society is something that is exclusive, so that few people have, but that becomes recognized as something that needs to be imitated or captured in order to gain status. So. Um, he gives um, an example of precious stones and why, why are precious stones and gems, why are they valuable? Precisely because of their exclusivity, but also the recognition that this, this is the attribute of rich life, for example, or um, being arist an aristocrat, right? having, having lots of, um, for example, gems and, and, and precious stones. And so 
this imitation by others, the recognition of this status by others, um, other classes, other groups in society, gives the possessor of distinction the power over the dispossessed. And so here, what I'm arguing is, um, if we take this argument and look at the international perceptions, I argue that positive self-concepts affirm a distinction that is, on the one hand, imitated, desired by others, so others want to be like us, but on the other hand, they need to stay unreachable. So um, we, we need to stay unreachable, um, and that creates hierarchies and that creates boundaries. And so the narratives of you know, how similar or how different we are from international others are not necessarily caused or reflective of the other's qualities. So, and again, that's where the accuracy um, literature would be looking at, but is more a coping mechanism that helps us affirm recognition, exclusivity, and maintain the identity boundary. Now, let me demonstrate that in, in the interview materials that um, I collected for, for this book. So, as I said, this, this book um, takes the principal example of the Arab uprisings and their perception in Russia and in Britain. So um, the book relies on over 50 interviews with members of the public in Russia and the UK. And um, to give you a, a broader context within the Russian interviews, largely the Arab uprisings were discussed as um, a matter of stability and order on the one hand and destabilization. And very often it was portrayed as the West versus Russia and the Arab uprisings were the battleground for, for influence. So connected to the Cold War, connected to um, the old um, the old stereotypes about Russia versus the West. The key words that the participants very often used in, in talking about the Arab uprisings were instability, West, American influence. And the media coverage was largely negative. Um, so Russian media was largely critical of the Arab uprisings at the time. Um, and um, two thirds of the participants um, in, in, in major polls had a very negative view of the uprisings. Russia was the nation out of the whole world, the nation where the perception of the Arab uprisings was the most negative. I also suggest that in talking about the uprisings, you know, why, why, why the stability came up so much is that it is the founding identity narrative in modern Russia, in, in post-Soviet Russia. So 71%, according to the poll in 2014, 71% of the Russian population are ready to sacrifice political freedoms and some of the other, uh, some, some of the human rights in order to prioritize stability. So stability is what matters. After the civil war of the 1917, after repressions during the Soviet Union, after the Second World War, the instability and mass crime of the 1990s, economic stability, political stability and continuity, even at the sake of freedoms, becomes the founding positive identity narrative. That is what matters. The British interviews revealed a very different picture. So in the British interviews, the perception of the Arab uprisings was largely democracy against dictatorships. And also on, on the margins, there was the, the fear of terrorism, the fear of the familiar um, terrorist other emerging in the region. The key words, the most common wor words that the participants used to describe the events were dictator, repression, democracy, murder, hope, protest. And contrary to Russia, two thirds of the British people viewed the Arab Spring events largely positively at the time of these events happening. And previously, again, uh, this also um, overlapped with some of the other beliefs, such as 60% um, of the respondents in Britain believing that democracy can work well in the Arab countries. So the expectation that the Middle East is going to democratize, is going to imitate um, the Western um, secular notions of democracy. So this is a little bit of a background. So the two, um, these two nations perceived the events of the Arab uprisings very differently, diametrically different. So one was very negative, the other was very positive. But what I argue is that the methods of relating and interpreting the uprisings was la were largely similar. So if we look at the Russian interviews, the dominant interpretation by the public was um, within the familiar frames of stability and instability. So, um, and these, these quotes come from different participants. Um, so one of them is saying it is a region which destabilized. It used to be stable, but with a big potential for instability, which has now turned wild. 
Another person is saying, when the revolution started, I think Libya was a rather stable country, although with quite a sultanic type of rule. And here it is quite, quite curious how, um, how the person mentions sultanic, because that's largely how the Middle East appears in the Russian popular imaginary. You know, from, from the very start in childhood, from tales of the Turkish sultans and, and viziers and uh, the firm hand, which is, yes, which could be very firm, but very just as well. So sultanic in this sense is quite a positive um, description that the, that the person is, um, is mentioning. And then another person is saying, and now there's destruction everywhere, people dying every day. This is just devastating. So a lot of other innocent people in other beautiful places can die because someone, and there was a very clear accusing gesture here, someone is discontent with their authorities. So it was clearly wrong to be discontent with the authorities. So largely what is happening is the interpretation of distant, uncertain events in Libya and Syria is largely done through the familiar frames of things that matter to, to us, that matter domestically, such as the narratives of stability and order. The other, the Libyan other, could only, you know, could, uh, could only desire stability. There was no question about that in the participants' um, uh, quotes. However, if, you know, if the protests were happening, then something must be wrong. They can't possibly be uh, not desiring our distinction. They can't possibly not desire stability. So there's something else that justifies their action. And so what we can see is the prohibition of the Libyan other as an object without any agency. So the Libyan rebels, the protesters, as, as the quote goes, probably simply thought that revolution would, uh, could, would bring better life. They heard democracy is good. They could be told the same about feudalism or whatever. They were told Gaddafi was a very bad person and wanted to oust him. And in Syria, it's the same. So it is curious to see how the Libyan other must desire stability. If they don't, they must be manipulated. So they couldn't possibly not desire stability. And so in order to, um, to eradicate, in order to eliminate this question to the Russian national identity, the Russian self, the stability as its distinction, the other becomes objectified and becomes uh, spoken about in completely passive terms. In another quote, the people in those countries do not know anything about democracy. They are used to living under tough rule, but that's in their own interest. So again, this hierarchy, this assumption of superiority, we know what's better for them, and they do not know. So the other becomes prohibited uh, without um, agency. There's also the displacement of the blame for these events on the familiar field ob objects. So for example, another person is saying, there's a reason why in Arab countries, people are not given enough freedom. I mean, look at elections in Egypt and Libya. Islamist parties are gaining and winning. That is worrying. These radicals will never, ever be peaceful. And in another, Libya is comparable to the Soviet war in Afghanistan, where the US sponsored Islamic terrorists against the Soviet army. And then they took control over the country and committed terrorist attacks of 2001. Um, and the recent killing of the US ambassador is one of the events in this line. So again, if the other is manipulated, because the other must, of course, desire what we desire, stability. So the other is manipulated by familiar, um, a familiar threatening um, subject. So either the US or, um, or terrorism. And so blame is displaced from familiar relationships, such as one of the per person says, the USA made a bad decision here, or the US is using various means not to let us gain what Russia used to have, and roughly speaking, to make those it doesn't like its colonies or European countries in the US decided to support this revolt. I see the main reason for this in like the desire to get a reduction in oil prices. So again, explaining distant familiar events as not something that Libyan people decided, not something that the Syrian people decided, because the only thing they could really want is to become like us. So therefore, if they are not, if they're protesting, that means that they're made to protest by somebody else, somebody more powerful like the United States. There were also small elements of uncertainty which were populated with self-informed uh, perceptions, uh, with, with memories from our own self. So, for example, the conflict ended when all big cities were taken by the rebels. And I think it was in October when Gaddafi was captured and officially shot under a tree or something. 
And this, this quote is curious because there's, it, it refers to an idiom in, in the Russian language, to shoot somebody under a tree or under a fence, is um, going all the way back to the Russian Civil War of the 1917, where that means shooting somebody without a trial, very unfairly, without giving them any chance to protect themselves. So this, this quote really displays sympathy towards Gaddafi and a suggestion that this was done very wrongly, very uncritically. Or um, an oppositional interviewee um, said, Gaddafi's rule reminds me of the situation with Russian corrupt authorities, this whole Putin instability thing, which I also do not quite believe. If everything was stable in Libya, why was there a queue to see Gaddafi's dead body? So, and here again, making sense of a distant, uncertain, unknown international crisis is done through relating those events to things we know from our own immediate past or present. The British interviews, um, again, I emphasize it was a completely different story. It was a narrative of the self-narrative of modernity and democracy and imitation by the other. But um, although the attitudes was much more positive, the way of relating to these events through the self-ideal of, of our own identity was, was largely present as well. So the explanations that the British participants uh, provided were these ones. The protesters were seeing everything in other parts of the world and they were like, you know what, we should get this as well. So they are all staging rallies and stuff and the dictators obviously didn't want any part of that. So it's basically just people wanting to become, uh, wanting more democraticish ways of life, I suppose. And, and so this idea that this is the Libyan and Syrian other finally imitating Western democracy. These are um, Libyans and Syrians, in other words, Westerners fighting for democracy in an Arab street. That uh, perception was largely the dominant one, where the other was positive because it was imitating the self. Another person um, suggested that it kind of surprises me how let's just imagine instead of Arab Spring, it was say Western Europe Spring. Let's say the people of Britain, France, Portugal, whatever, instead of grasping at guns, you know, arming yourselves and being terrorist like, why not just say, listen, we are unhappy. Let's do a vote. And if the majority thinks you should still be in power, you know, you stay. But if the vote says you're not wanted anymore, you should leave. Why don't they do the same thing we do? You know, they think we dislike them because they're Middle Eastern or African countries or whatever. You know, it's because they do things like this. It's because they act so barbaric in their transition of powers. I mean, there should be a more democratic transition of powers. What is interesting about this quote is, again, this unquestioning expectation that the other is supposed to be imitating us, is supposed to value our distinction, our identity narrative of democracy and progress. If the other doesn't do things like us, they must be barbaric. So there's a similar prohibition of the other as um, backward or inferior in case the other does not want to be like us, does not share our distinction. This is also evident in the quotes how, how the British participants uh, drew a line between the government of Libya and Syria and, and the people. So as, as one of the persons, um, one of the British participants um, spoke about the reasons for, for the uprising, was it not to do with an oppressive government and a coup? A lot of it was to do with lying to his people and using some kind of debilitating gases that affected tons of his population and that he denied using. Um, and so in these quotes, what is happening is that the dictators, um, Assad, Gaddafi, become single, absolutely isolated, absolutely unpopular. So they are contrasted against all of the other people so as, as the bottom quote says, he's fighting against all the people. So all the people are, of course, um, imitating and, um, and, and wanting democratic ways of life. But um, he, as the dictator, becomes prohibited because um, that is somebody who does not want to be um, like us. And that self-affirmation was also present in, in, again, in banal things like, uh, for example, the quote here, I think it's a reaction of the general population against an oppressive regime. They're more educated now and they're looking for their freedom, liberty to express themselves. So they're more educated, they're following this um, linear trajectory of, of becoming like us. Or another, uh, another person is saying, I don't imagine like there's a normal chain of command there as you'd have in like West. So again, small things pointing at how, you know, what, what, um, what the Western nations had 
was the norm, was um, the ideal to be imitated. And the other was judged, positive or negative, according to what the response was like, uh, or how the participant saw the other responding to the self-ideal. At the same time, the self was largely unreachable. So um, the self was ideal, but it was unreachable to, to others. Um, so for example, one of the participants spoke about um, Western people supposedly doing things better, and then that is the Western burden of what a political system should look like. Another person spoke about a duty to protect the people. We in the West have the resources and the political sway to make changes that other nations do not necessarily have. So I think that we are obligated to help. And then another one was just questioning whether there could ever be a leader like Assad in the UK, for example, because I think because we are above, we never stoop as low as to violence or to effectively enslaving one's, one's people. So again, what, what these quotes portray are largely self-representations as well as representations of the other. And in this relationship, the portrayal of the self is idealized. So in imagining distant crisis, the participants both in Russia and the UK were idealizing their own self-conceptions and were prohibiting those elements of the other who were seen not to recognize that distinction, not to try to imitate it. So, um, and, and, and um, this is just, again, one of the quotes where um, some of the more feared others, such as Al-Qaeda, could, uh, could be mentioned in, um, in, the, in the public perceptions of, of the events. But again, this, this was done to justify the violence that um, was discovered, was started to be reported in the media, how these protests suddenly turned into civil wars and how they became violent. But this is a transitional period. And so quite a few of the British participants still gave um, the protesters and the rebels the benefit of the doubt, saying that this is the trans transition, um, Rome wasn't built in a day, etc. So some of the conclusions, final conclusions, and um, I'll stop with them. So one of the things I'm arguing is Public perceptions are unconsciously introverted. We need to look at the drawing self, the unconscious motivations, hopes, fears, aspirations, identity narratives that stand behind our portraits of others. Secondly, I argue that societies seek to maintain positive and continuous self-conceptions and that their imagining of distant others becomes a source of security and empowerment. So it doesn't matter whether the other is represented accurately or not accurately. What matters is that this, the self maintains a positive and continuous self-conception. So in doing so, publics may interpret events in ways that depart significantly from complex reality. They could be relating events um, to memories from, from our own past, such as um, that student in Moscow who spoke about Gaddafi relating them to, to the Soviet leader Brezhnev and therefore evaluating the whole event as um, in, in a very particular light. I also argue that representations of international events um, that help maintain positive and stable self-concepts may be particularly convincing, even if, they are, even if they are inaccurate or conspiratorial. And finally, I argue that societies wish not only to be positive, but to inspire imitation while remaining unreachable, so protecting their distinctions. And so the narratives of similarity difference are not just stereotypes, are not just inaccurate representations, which could be fixed with a better understanding or bit better into community contact, but they are rather coping mechanisms, defensive mechanisms that become a way to protect that idea of distinction. So I'll stop here. So thank you very much for listening, and I really look forward to to your questions. So um, this is uh, a 30% discount code for the book if anybody is interested in reading more, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.